All right, I guess we can get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Puneet Ravel, and I'm the guy who's standing between you and the drinks at the bar. <laughs> or the vintage games you can play if you were not hitting me enough. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to be talking about how Aetna uh, has achieved faster app development using the latest governance framework they've built. I'm in company of a couple of architects from Aetna. I'll be talking about how they've achieved that, their journey through MarkLogic. And I'll make sure uh, I can ask questions to understand how they have done it. I'll be asking questions throughout the presentation. Rupinder, do you want to go and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Rupinder. Um, I joined Aetna's MarkLogic Center of Excellence about three years ago as a subject matter expert. And uh, prior to joining Aetna, I have worked with MarkLogic for about six years, overall 13 years of experience in application development area. And I have seen the evolution of MarkLogic project from version 3 onwards. Uh, it's at version 9. Um, and it has been my pleasure in this journey so far, and I look forward to the future. Thanks, and over to you, Leanne. Hi, I'm Leanne Swandy. I'm also a subject matter expert in MarkLogic and um, application software delivery advisor and in the center of excellence at Aetna. Um, so prior to joining Aetna more than three years ago, um, I, I've worked as a MarkLogic developer on various projects uh, for the Department of Defense, um, healthcare.gov, and others. Um, so first, an introduction on Aetna. Uh, we are a healthcare company committed to helping people live um, healthier lives. Uh, we proudly serve 49 and a half million members, and our um, health insurance plans and services include um, medical, pharmacy, um, and dental plans, Medicare plans, Medicaid services, uh, um, behavioral health programs, and, um, and medical management. So at Anna, um, our mission is to build a healthier world by helping people uh, realize their best health. And we achieve that with um, in integrity, um, excellence, um, caring, and inspiration um, as our core values that we put uh, the people that we serve um, at the center of everything we do. Um, and <laughs> we hold ourselves accountable uh, for delivering the results that our um, customers and members expect. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, that we have this opportunity today um, to share our experience and perspective of how we use the framework that we have developed uh, in, to build MarkLogic data hubs and, and the role our framework plays um, in building these data hubs. So our story began in late 2014. Aetna formed the MarkLogic Center of Excellence uh, um, for the enterprise Enterprise in, um, Integration Initiative to build an operational data hub uh, to bring together uh, silo data such as claims, um, membership, um, preferences, um, provider data, and such. And Ruben will actually go in, into the detail, details on the use cases. But going back to my story, um, so uh, about three years ago, more than three years ago, um, <clears throat> Um, at that time, what was used at Aetna were primarily um, traditional relational databases. And, and thus, moving into the NoSQL space was not exactly met with welcoming open arms. Um, so there were um, many people were um, skeptical of what we were trying to do with the Mark Logic. And um, in addition to that uncertainty, there were pushbacks. Um, so as a new hire joining Aetna in mid-2015, um, it was unsettling for me um, when in most of the technical discussions, um, the questions posed to the MarkLogic Center of Excellence were, um, why are we using MarkLogic? I mean, even more than six months after the start of the project. Um, so fast forward three years, we're no longer being asked that question at least not rhetorically. Um, and instead, we're being asked, instead, we're being asked um, um, 
to give an overview of what um, of Mark Logic, and um, because teams wanted to know more about Mark Logic, or they come to us uh, <coughs> to find out if using Mark Logic was a good fit for their project. Um, so this change in um, viewpoint towards Mark Logic was definitely um, the result of the success that we had in in um, you know, implementing an operational data, but a data hub within an extremely ambitious time frame. Um, so today's presentation, I will start with an overview. Okay, oops, too many. Oh, right. Okay. So in today's presentation, I will start with an overview, and then Rupinder will um, go into details on why we use Mark Logic and the use cases that Anna. Okay, the, the mission of Mar uh, Markologic Center of Excellence, oops, sorry. The mission of Markologic um, Center of Excellence team is to work towards the best, most uh, effect efficient, most effective solutions to keep the cost down. And we built this thinking into our, the, the design of our framework. Um, so the framework started as um, code reuse, um, to solve common problems. And next, we added governance into the features to drive um, consistency and standards. And then we added automation uh, with more intelligent and sophisticated capabilities. Today, we have over 30 features in our framework. Also, we, we, we had started with open source code, if possible. Our bulk features were built on top of MLCP and CORB. Um, these are Java-based, uh, multi-threaded, open source projects that are very good for um, batch processing. MLCP is, um, lets you um, import, export, copy data to and from MarkLodge databases, and CORB uh, lets you select a set of documents and apply XQuery uh, on them. Uh, we also use um, Roxy in our framework. Um, Roxy is a Ruby-based utility for configuration and deploying um, MarkLogic applications. Uh, you can define configuration files for the, uh, the databases in, in the app servers, and then you can add, remove, uh, modify, or remove these, uh, these settings uh, remotely from um, the command line. Most of our framework features are um, support application-specific customization through the use of hooks that you can put in the configuration settings. Our framework features uh, are primarily configuration-driven, so we developed a, um, a configuration editor um, with a user interface, and we also developed some dashboards to provide us um, with data that's um, persisted by the um, framework and, and some um, helpful system level information as well. And another important aspect um, is that our framework makes it possible to integrate um, with our, the existing infrastructure. So our bulk features um, of the framework integrate CORB and MLCP to automate our existing workflows um, by providing the plumbing to the, um, the existing scheduling system um, for controlling the batch processing and to the log management software we were already using um, and to export um, data from the MarkLogic databases for downstream processing. Above all that, um, the framework provides a, a standard and efficient way to deal with the data, uh, including ingest, egress, enrichment tagging, um, document handling, archival and purging. But most importantly, the framework leaves a trace of everything that's being done with the data. Uh, who did what, when.
we are using framework to expedite application development. Um, at Anna, we have multiple um, Scrum teams developing applications independ independently on the MarkLogic platform. And the development of the framework, however, is done by the Center of Excellence in cadence with the application development teams. The Center of Excellence um, also has the role of oversight over the shared resources um, and in leading the Scrum teams to adoption of the framework and in, in com compliance uh, to standard standardized or best practices across um, all application development on the platform. Okay, so as mentioned earlier, we designed the framework to solve common problems, but we also designed it to be flexible um, using hooks to, uh, for application or domain specific programming. For example, a particular ingest service may be configured to, um, to do raw data transformation, and a hook can be placed in the configuration setting um, to apply the transformation before the framework ingestion takes place. And in this manner, um, the framework applies consistent envelope pattern um, and enrichment tagging um, during ingestion, but it all at while well, the same at the same time it allows for um, transformation according to business rules. Some of our um, framework components are built in. For example, the um, service metrics request routing, air trapping, and logging. These are uh, part of every service request to the data hub. And the others are um, components that can be, that are reusable, configurable, um, that can be imported as needed. Um, so, um, for example, um, ingest, validation, bulk processing, application logging, and about 30, no, more than 30 other features. With this approach of using framework, the application teams can go straight to the application logic um, and get a jump start right, on, um, on the complex uh, queries of business logics, business rules, thereby um, reducing um, development time and more quickly deliver to product production. Our ingestion framework has multiple features to, um, to handle data integration. Um, in harmonizing the data, it applies the envelope pattern and adds data provenance. Transformation, uh, data transformation is configurable and customizable. Versioning is applied um, by default or can be configured to be removed. Um, our um, ingestion framework handles both um, real-time and batch processing. Um, and um, it also provides the feature to, for validation, both on the schema and the data itself. Um, <clears throat> to meet um, ambitious timelines, at, agility is important. We, we build flexibility to our framework to meet agile business requirements. Um, and we do this by using configuration to drive the framework features um, and the framework in turn drive agile delivery of solutions. The configurability of the framework not only gives us agility, but it also gives us the um, ability to orchestrate timely execution of various steps in, involved in complex bulk processing, such as um, the bulk data upgrade that Rubinder will talk about. We use framework to ensure governance on the data that comes from multiple silos. Through our framework, we, um, we are achieving govern, governance goals shaped by strategic mandates, uh, architectural um, directions at the enterprise level. Also, using the framework becomes the means through which we can identify processes that are out of compliance. 
um, or, or not following uh, the, the standards that uh, the Center of Excellence recommends. By having the right messages logged across applications, uh, framework gives us um, visibility across data types for overall governance in global security, uh, resource management, uh, and conflict resolution. We can more easily identify usage conflicts or waste of resources. The consistency the framework gives us uh, helps us to see when something is not right or out of place. And with consistency in ingest, egress, air handling, logging, um, um, enrichment tagging, it is easier to see um, trends and detect patterns and identify areas for improvement. Next, Rupinder will talk about in more details um, of how we use MarkLogic at Aetna. Okay, uh, so everyone must be wondering why why it not decided to choose MarkLogic, right? So we have a lot of NoSQL databases out there, but but why MarkLogic? So this decision was made before I joined Aetna. So, <laughs> but I was able to talk to architecture folks and and get their opinion on why they chose to go with MarkLogic. And there there are such different goals listed out on the slide, but. The, the major goals uh, they were going after was data models, right? So we have changing data models, and they, they keep on changing as the business changes, right? Uh, Aetna is a huge insurance company, right? Uh, and you get lots of different claims from lots of different parties, and, and they keep on changing. So they wanted to have a system which can support all of that. So, and MarkLogic is a good product to support, which supports all of that. The other major goal was security. Now, everyone wants security, right? And, and MarkLogic provides a very good level of security, both at the document level and with now MarkLogic 9, it also provides you security to basically secure PII level of data. The other major goal which was important to Aetna was fast random access. And I'm going to touch base on that uh, later in my slides. But, but that's another deciding factor why they went with MarkLogic. You need fast random access. You can lump all of the data into Data Hub, but if you don't get that, then it's not useful. So how, how is MarkLogic used at Aetna? Uh, the, the primary goal of using Mark, MarkLogic at Aetna is uh, setting up an enterprise data hub. We get lots of different types of data from different domains, and there are different sources which are providing us that data. We, and you can consider those as data silos, and all those data silos are lumped together into one data hub so that you can integrate that data more easily and it, it provides for a single point of integration and ease of integration. You don't have to go to different sources at different times and get data. So it, it's all out there. You, you can do whatever you want to. And then you can easily serve up that data using REST and phases or even batch use cases. So um, I talked about fast random access, right? So the, the primary goal of setting up Data Hub was cache. So we use MarkLogic as cache. Uh, so instead of going to different sources at runtime and get that data, it adds on that complexity, right? And it adds on to the time. So we have all the data in one central repository. We go there, and that's considered a cache. And it, it is updated frequently. You don't have, the, the folks don't have to worry about at the egress time worrying about whether that is a refreshed copy or not, it's always refreshed. And for all the, the data where we need real-time updates, we do that into the Data Hub. And I'm going to talk about that also. But there are also other cases where we use uh, MarkLogic as a book of record, where we don't have any other source systems where that data is coming from. So there's some of data which is generated 
out of some of the processes which we want to store, we store them in the data hub, uh, but as a separate database, and we consider that as a book of record or, in other words, source of truth. So um, while I was preparing for this, uh, a question came to my mind, and uh, I think lots of folks have talked about that already. Uh, so this is a, we call this as a framework, uh, and this is considered a data hub framework. Now MarkLogic has its own version of data hub framework. So I'm going to ask the question to Puneet, who is from MarkLogic. Which framework do you, do you think is better? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. Our, data, our framework is better than yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, so reality is that Aetna was an early adopter, and uh, uh, they started developing a pattern of data integration. And we started realizing that that pattern is used at all the customers. Um, all the customers are there landing the data first, harmonizing it, and then utilizing it. We, as MathLogic team in consulting, we were doing the same. We were doing the same thing with other customers, too. So it's like, why not get all these best practices that we've collected through all the customers and make a framework out of it so other customers can follow it? Data framework is now part of the product, so it is supported by product, too. If you use it, you'll be supported, and you'll be following the standard that other customers are following, too. That gives you a benefit of, uh, of transitioning your skill from, from one project to another, from one company to another, and we're building skill set with that, too. So it really helps out. Uh, Aetna, uh, what they've done is uh, uh, they've built something similar uh, to what we've done uh, already on the product. There, there are not a lot of differences of what you guys are doing and what we have done on the framework side. One subtle difference might be that uh, when you, if you're using MarkLogic's Data Hub framework, uh, you, you get two databases, one for landing your data, which is a staging database, and other one is the final copy where the harmonized data go. And you guys might be following a different standard than that, which is okay. Uh, important thing is that you follow the standard, basically the operational Data Hub pattern that is uh, needed for a data integration project. I hope that answers your questions. Definitely answers my question. I hope it answers everyone's question as well. So that's the difference between the Mark Logic Hub framework and what we have. And and Puneet rightly said, it, this this Mark Logic Data Hub framework came out of Aetna's initiative. So so that's where we are. So this is the brief <laughs> picture about the Data Hub framework. So um, coming back to the use cases of uh, MarkLogic and Aetna. So um, when, when we are ingesting uh, data into uh, Data Hub, um, one of our primary goal was, um, and it was, it was architectural decision uh, based on some of the use cases we had. So whenever we are ingesting data into MarkLogic, any new updates which are happening to the system, we don't replace the existing copy we ingest it as a new version. And, and the primary reason for doing that was we want to have auditing capabilities, right? How the data is changing. We, we want to show the simple history, how the data is changing over time. So a, a user might be wondering, like, if, if they are going into the system, the, their applications, right, how the claims are changing. So by doing all of that, we can show to the users how, how your claim has changed over time. And, and the way we are doing this is not same as what MarkLogic uh, does internally with the updates, right? So whenever you are replacing any document within MarkLogic and you are replacing that at the same URI, MarkLogic internally also creates uh, something called as fragment and, and replaces the, it keeps the older fragment until it merges the whole data. So, but, but this is separate from what MarkLogic internally does. This is, we call it as data versioning. And it's similar to the bitemporal concept, uh, which, which got introduced into MarkLogic, but um, we are not using that yet, uh, but we can go there. We, we, our data versioning is portable to go there. And um, since we are ingesting lots of uh, different versions out there, uh, but we are we are primarily focusing our APIs, our the real-time APIs or REST services 
they work off the most recent active documents out there. There are some use cases which go to the historical, um, which I talked about, like claim history. If, if the folks want the claim history, they can go, to, go through that. But most of our use cases are working on active documents. Now, uh, this also introduces a complexity. Uh, whenever there are updates happening to the system, right, you are adding more, data, more and more data as in the, the, the updates are happening. So this, this fills up the space quickly, right? And you want to be able to handle that as well. So uh, we internally also developed a purging framework in order, to, in order to handle that. So that actually takes care of the, the obsolete or the historical versions, which in some cases you only probably want to store seven days worth of data. In other cases, they probably want to use a month uh, old data, right? So all of that is configurable. Um, as, as Leon pointed out, right, we have hooks. So for different source types, uh, application teams who are working with different source types, they can specify how many days or how many versions they want to retain into the system. And, and framework works off those configurations and, and stores them and only retains that much amount of data. So here, Pneet, uh, you were going to ask me some question, right? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, so purging seems like an operation uh, that would delete a lot of data and uh, clear it out. So Leon mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that you guys use CORB a lot. Uh, is that the place where you use CORB? Yeah, um, that definitely. We use CORB a lot, and this is just one of the use cases. Uh, we use uh, CORB in purging. We use in archival, which I'm going to talk about. And we use also to send off the data to uh, our data lake environment. So we use that a lot, and, and it's a good MartLogic uh, feature. Uh, it's an open source uh, framework, which we have utilized a lot, and we have customized it a lot. So it, it, it's definitely a good feature. Um, so coming back to the purging and archiving, right? So, um, so we purged the obsolete versions out there, and it's all built into the framework provided by the configurations. But there's one more thing which uh, architecture wanted us to do before we can purge that data out. So we spend a lot of time creating that data into the hub, right? We ingested raw data, we transformed it, we created a lot of data out there. But before we purge it out, even though business is saying, I don't need this data, we still want to retain that copy. So before we purge out, we archive that data into data lakes. and and that's all handled by framework, right? So if, if, the, if the source team provides that purging configuration, they have to have provide an archival configuration. There are exceptional cases where they can configure not to do versioning, but that's exceptional approval. They have to take care of that before we can allow that. And that allows for the governance part of it, right? So we, we govern what data comes in, what data goes out, and and what data gets purged. So all of that is basically handled by framework, and it's all configuration driven. Can I ask a question here? You asked too many questions. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> so you guys are part of the COE team, with, and you guys uh, are in charge of this uh, framework you put together for right now. Uh, the sources of data that are coming through, uh, are they coming in real time, or they're coming in batches? What, how do you get data to this framework? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and in fact, that was the topic of my next slide. So let's go there. So we, we do have uh, real-time processing, and uh, we do have batch processing, right? So as I was pointing out earlier, uh, in some of the use cases, uh, we need up-to-date, refreshed copy of data from the source systems we have. So we have in-house event framework which was developed to handle that. So events are nothing but triggers which are fired by different source systems we have out there. And then Data Hub consumes those events. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's subscribed to those events. And then that data gets refreshed into the Data, data Hub. There are two different types of events we have. Uh, in some of the cases, we get the 
payload in the event itself, so we don't have to go back to the source systems. But in other cases, we just get some bits and pieces of information about that event, and then we, using that, we go back to the source systems and get that data out of source systems. So it's all decoupled. There's no tight coupling between the source systems and this data hub. And, and it's a it's, it's good feature which we developed. It's all asynchronous. And it allows for the flexibility we have with, uh, so if source system goes down, then Data Hub is still there. Data Hub is, can still serve up the, the app application needs. And the other great point about that was why we need that real time, right? We need cons consistent views across our different applications. So some of our, for our, some of our applications, they are still talking to the older legacy systems. But some of the newer applications, they are talking directly to the data hub. And we don't want one, one uh, person to go to the older application and see one, one copy of the data, and the folks who are coming to the newer application, they are seeing an uh, older copy of the data. So that's why we do the real-time updates. In, in other cases, we also do batch updates where we can get away with that kind of need where we don't need to refresh that copy right away. Uh, and we do have batch use cases. And, and that's where we, we primarily used uh, MarkLogic Content Pump and Corb. So, so MarkLogic Content Pump or MLCP is used to ingest the raw data as is. And um, in our framework, <laughs> we ingest it in the same database. We don't create a separate database. So it's, it's all out there. Um, so it, it's ingested as raw, and then we use Corb to do the transformation as and when required. And it's also, we have flexibility to do that transformation at runtime when the data is, is getting ingested, or it can happen later on. So that, that kind of flexibility is provided by the framework. So does that answer your question? It does, but I have two more questions for you. Oh, God. <laughs> So you talked about uh, having two versions of application or two versions of your data. It looks like your data model changes a lot, right? right? Uh, how do you promote that data model change uh, to your existing data source that's already loaded? You might have already a lot of data loaded and application are already using it. Yeah, so... That was one of the major goals, right, uh, which I discussed about uh, changing data models. And that, that's why MarkLogic was selected as that NoSQL DB of choice. So um, we, uh, we developed a feature called as bulk upgrade, uh, which can help us with that. So our data models keep on changing, but we don't want to affect the live production systems also, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to handle that, um, what we do was we have... And, and to give an example, uh, I've shown this on the slide, right? So at the time of, or before the upgrade, we ask, uh, we provide framework hooks uh, to the application teams so that they can configure their existing service to talk to only the existing set of documents. And, and, and we, we developed a feature called as bulk upgrade, utilizing which they can upgrade the existing set of documents and create a new version. And we call them as V2, and they can talk, uh, set up a new service using, uh, the, again, the framework hooks out there to talk to the V2 set of documents. So V1 is talking to V1, uh, the older set of documents, and V2 is talking to the newer data model V2 version documents. Once the upgrade is all complete and we can have a brief amount of downtime, we stop the updates from happening and then we, we cut over to the older service. And, and it's all seamless, it's all handled by framework. We, we have framework configurations which drive that upgrade and which drive that service to talk to only V1 set of documents. And once the upgrade is done, the, the V1 service is sunsetted and there's another feature which marks those V1 documents out there as obsolete. And once those are obsolete, the purging framework I talked about, it takes care of removing that, those documents from the system. So that's how it is handled. Do you have any more questions? Yes, I do. <laughs> one last one for you. 
Now, this is great. Uh, this is very informative. Uh, I was wondering, uh, it looks like you, you have multiple uh, projects that are being developed in parallel to with multiple projects. What happens is uh, you have multiple versions uh, of the application. So how do you make sure people can develop in parallel using the same, same schema model and deploy at the same time too? How do you make sure they, they're not interrupted? So, um, so that was the main goal, right, of why framework, right? So, so we have this framework, uh, which is set of reusable components, which we have developed, which can be used by different application teams. And we have application teams which are working on different source types. So they are focused on their source type alone. They are not worrying about the other application team source, source type. The only um, dependency between the framework and the application team is that framework has to be out there. So, so, so for an application team to be successful, they just need the framework. They don't need the other application teams, uh, source code, or, or other, other functions. So we have frameworks which are Roxy-based, and, and uh, Leon touched upon Roxy. Um, Roxy is a very good tool which we, which we came uh, with, and uh, we use it for our deployment purposes and for request routing purposes. And um, I know after Roxy, now uh, we have a very good tool called as Gradle, uh, so which is also used for deployment purposes. But right now, uh, our frameworks are based on Roxy, and we use the Roxy deployments to do that. And in, in most of the cases, we try to be uh, we try to keep our frameworks backward compatible uh, as far as possible so that they don't have to affect the uh, live production systems. And the only dependency between uh, the application and framework, as I talked about, is a uh, framework has to be there because the application code is deployed using the REST endpoint which fram framework provides. And that's again why, because it's, it provides the governance, right? We don't want different teams out there going on their own and deploying their code in their own way. So we have, for even for deployment, we have standardized that. Uh, what, what are the benefits? The major benefit, as Leon talked about, is uh, faster delivery, and, and we, we can do it in, in a parallel way. So we, we meet those deadlines, which, which we need to. And, and to give an example, uh, the first project which we did, uh, if, if we had done that with traditional technologies, I would say it would have taken us three years or more, but we did it in nine months. Nice. So, so I think I talked about a lot. I'll, I'll touch, I'll hand over to Leanne to do the closing. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so if you've got most, um, lots of teams um, developing, developing applications independently, how do you get them to maintain standards? Or, and, and how do you know when something is not in compliance? So in summary, if you don't have a framework that covers all areas of micrologic development, uh, then very quickly the different teams could be creating their own version of ingestion. And then you, you, you don't have uh, an efficient way uh, of having governance. Um, and I told you the secret sauce, right? To get the most bang um, for the buck, add features to the framework that cover most common patterns which multiple teams will, will uh, use. Um, and the secret ingredient is to build configuration-driven features. And so you want to think about um, including a set of configurations that make sense to have to support the multiple teams with their different requirements. Um, and also consider uh, the different <coughs> configuration needs over time um, as requirements can and do change. The, frame, the framework um, gives us traceability, which is important 
and, and audits. The framework gives us <laughs> visibility across applications, and we can more easily recognize where to improve efficiency. Um, finally, it allows for faster development um, and delivery of solutions. The first implementation, as Ruben Durr mentioned earlier, um, of Mark Logic at Aetna, from, from scratch going to live, uh, scoped for a line of business, took nine months. And, and it, it would not have been possible with um, traditional technologies. Um, and then later, we were able to shrink that delivery um, time even further. Um, when we repeated the implementation of MarkLogic Data Hubs, again, starting from scratch and going to live for an entirely different line of business, um, it only took four months. Um, and this was with new development teams, not those from the first implementation. And that also includes the path to production, the development environment, the QA, the um, UAT, and um, stress performance testing, and the production environment. So that concludes our um, presentation today. Thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Any questions? I have a question. So, uh, versioning of Wait for the mic. I do have a question. So, for versioning of the data, so when you are uh, make, uh, moving from version one to version two, how long does that process take to to finish? And uh, how? Uh, what is the data load? How many uh, claims? If you want the number of claims, you are converting in what time? That's the question. Eh? I mean, it depends on the type of data you are working with. Um, claims, claims, for example. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can do it in a very fast way. It, it really depends on how big your nodes are, right? How, how many nodes you have in your system, right? Mm -hmm. We use CORB again for doing that. So we can increase the number of threads. We can scale out horizontally if we need to do it in a faster way. Um, we didn't do claims, so I cannot give you numbers on there. But we did membership. So we did membership, I think, in one day. How All the data account? was what upgraded was in one day. But how many uh, records, if you want, or how, what is the data? Um, I don't want to give you false information, so I'll check and get back to you on that. Okay. But it was, it was very fast. So it's not like taking like months and months doing those updates. It takes it days, or even sometimes in hours. So it totally depends on the amount of data set you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another question, if I may. Uh, so, when you get your claims into the system, I guess it com they come through EDI or something like that, right? And then you said you are using Content Pump to ingest into Mark Logic. How do you do that? How, what is that uh, process? So, uh, for claims, we get the, the claims in files, and uh, we have flat files. So we get those flat files, and then we uh, do the ingestion via MLCP as raw oh, documents. And then once they are out there, we do the transformation. And it's, it's, I think for claims, it's not happening at runtime. We do it asynchronously. And we have a separate feature. We didn't talk about that, but that's a separate feature called job queuing, where we do that uh, asynchronous transformation. And that allows not only for asynchronous transformation, that also allows us to do any other sort of stuff which we want to handle asynchronously. Thank you. Yep. Uh, regarding um, batch and real-time processing, like in the same records, uh, can you elaborate on that? Like we have a use case similar to that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't get your question exactly. Like when when you're doing like batch feed and uh, a real-time feed, right. both for the same database. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on that? We have similar kind of use case. Like uh, So um, we developed a event-based framework, right? So uh, for real-time needs. So whenever the source system is changing, any updates are happening in the source system, they fire us the events. And those events itself, in some cases, because all the source systems, they don't work same, right? Some source systems, they give us the payload in the event itself. 
And in other cases, we have to go back to the source system, uh, either via REST or, or something else, right? So we get that data into the system asynchronously or synchronously. But for batch feeds, um, we get files. Mm -hmm. And we are working on different sets of data. It's not the same data, but it's, it's on the same database. So we have, to give an example, we have provider data, which is coming us via batch feeds. Because it's not, I mean, they need it in real time, but it's not, uh, they don't need a refreshed copy all the time out there. But, and it's, it's a lot of data. You, uh, for, for providers, they, they do updates like crazy. I mean, if you start expecting real time, it's not feasible that much. But for, for, uh, for membership, whenever there are updates happening, those are real time because those drive the applications and, and they, they need that membership data to, to actually, uh, the contact center needs that data real time. And they don't want that service at real time to talk to source system because the whole point of Data Hub is having the refresh copy and, and it, having it as a cache. Mm -hmm. If you have to talk to the source system again, then that defeats the purpose. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is like we get for the same feed, like uh, in some of the data will come like in batch, and uh, some of them will come like uh, on real time also. And I was wondering like uh, how you're managing with the harmonization and all, like because it's the same set of data. Uh. <laughs> Do you have that kind of use case? And uh, did you use that? Um, I mean, I, I try to answer as best as I can, but I think we can connect offline and sure. yeah, talk about it more. And one more thing, like how often do you archive? We archive on daily basis. So you archive whatever you have like in the mark logic to the data lake on daily basis? Yes. Okay. What else are you using as a... But it's also configurable. So our framework is... Um, it's it can keep, it's capable of doing hourly, daily, monthly, depending yeah. upon the configuration. Yeah, the reason we are asking is like we also have that kind of use case, like trying to do like a archiving to data lake. Right. That's why I'm asking like. Yeah, it's a pretty generic uh, feature. So and and we have built-in governance in there. Uh, we need that data to be archived first before it can be purged. Exactly. We are also from insurance and we have audit issues like oh, we need versioning for that. Right. That is the reason we are wondering. And for building analytics on top of it, do you uh, join between historical data and this or how do you do? Mm, that's a question out of scope. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I don't deal with data lakes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hi, could you talk very briefly about uh, your COE, how many projects you're supporting and intend to support, and the size and construct of it? So um, it, it varies, right, uh, according to the timeline. Right now, I think we have about 12 members on Center of Excellence, and uh, we are supporting about four or five different initiatives. So, um, and I know three of them are in production, and uh, two of them, we are working in getting them to production. And it has all happened within the last three years. Uh, very impressive work. Uh, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, in your uh, developing your solution based on MarkLogic, what are the main challenges that you have faced and uh, how did you address those challenges? Yeah, I'll let Leah uh -huh. answer that. <laughs> well, one of the biggest um, challenges we have was with the size of the documents. Um, and and there's, there's a, Mark Lodger has a recommendation, you know, the optimal size of documents is between 10 to 100 KB. Um, and, but, you know, um, when we first started the, with the framework and, um, and the, 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 all the application teams were ingesting based on their, you know, their model, data model, and, and, and some, some of the documents grew 
to uh, unmanageable size, over 100 megabytes and such. And, and it was causing, it was giving us a performance issue. And how we handle that is, um, well, first, we, we added to the, the, the enrichment tagging a, um, a field for, um, to, to put the size of the document in the field as well. And so we can look across the different uh, data sets and, um, and, and see you know, where are the, the problem areas and we address them. Mike. When the documents are big, like uh, does when we have like three different nodes, like uh, distributing between it, does it help? Well, with the with document size, documents going in 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 you know three digit megabytes, um, it it can <laughs> it can take time. Uh, for that to load, and then you go into um, um, cache issues. Okay? You run out of caches, and, and you have expenditure errors and whatnot. It all depends on how the application teams um, coded their, uh, you know, their searches. Um, I mean, you can use the indexes, okay, properly, but then if you um, if you need to get anything out of the document that's not part of the index, then you know your your your, your performance just go way down when you when you have those large document sizes. Yeah, you you gotta break it up. There is no other way. <laughs> there is, uh, I have a similar kind of use case. That's the reason. I'm yeah, asking. either you break it up or you extract certain metadata out of it and create a separate document. So for your search purposes, you go against the metadata. Because you don't need like 100 megabyte document out there serving it up, right? You will probably use it for batch use case, but not for real time showing up on the web. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, for batch only, I'm talking like yeah, right. uh, for the bigger documents because sometimes we get like uh, some of the applications send like kind of 1 GB kind of documents for the daily feed. Right. I mean, you can extract metadata and work off uh, that metadata for your search purposes and then keep that bigger documents for batch use cases. That one, I'm looking for MLCP only into as is, then like we can break it up. Uh, um, does it work? I don't think so. There is a hard limit of 5 to LMB. You cannot load a bigger document than that, right? Yeah. How? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> one additional. We have time for one last question before we all head downstairs to the innovation of, of gaming party this evening. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Thank you.